Welcome to Embedded. I am Elysia White here with Christopher White, and I am so pleased to welcome Limor Freed on the show because it's been a long time and we wanted to talk to her. Hi, Limor. Hey, hey. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. For the very few people who are listening who don't know who you are, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so my name is Lamore Freed, and I also go by Lady Ada. That's my handle. And I am the founder and lead engineer of a company called Adafruit, which is based here in Manhattan, which is where I'm recording from right now. And we do uh, open source hardware and open source software and firmware. So we are a manufacturing company. I have a manufacturing line. So I have like picking places and the selective solder machines and all that good stuff and a crew of about 100 people. And I do um, the designs for open source hardware, uh, whether it be an MP3 player or portable game system or development boards or breakout boards. And then we manufacture it here in New York uh, with our team. And then we ship it also from New York around the world. We actually recently hit our two millionth order, which is a very big number. Um, yes. So we've been doing it for about like 13 years now, since 2005. I started in Boston, but then you know moved to New York in 2006 and been doing it here since. Cool. Uh, we want to do lightning round, which will be short questions and hopefully short answers. And hopefully we won't ask you for all the details. Okay. All right. Uh, we already know the answer to this, but Adafruit or Adafruit? It's Adafruit. But you know what? Say it how you like. <laughs> Ada Lovelace or Ada King? Um, both. I think, I mean, Ada Lovelace is, um, you know, basically who I named the company after, um, that was my handle. And, you know, I thought, just thought it was neat that there was this woman who was like a gambler and kind of a troublemaker, but also really good at math. And she kind of wrote the first algorithm, which I thought was really cool. Favorite component? I really like shocky diodes. So handy. Best place to visit in Manhattan? Um, well, you can't be just walking around the city. I mean, the city is a character. It's alive. Um, I love walking around. Uh, you know, I walk around in Soho and, and West Village, but um, around Central Park is also beautiful. It's, it's a country into, unto itself. What is a tip you think everyone should know? Um, add more 0.1 microfarad capacitors. Like really, you can always remove them later and it never hurts. Actually, nowadays I go for a one microfarad. Why not? It's not a 10, it's not 0.1. It's good value. They're like salt. It's good on everything. Yeah, just sprinkle them because, you know, it's, it, you don't need them just like you don't need seat belts, maybe. But then if you need them, you really need them. <laughs> it makes everything better. Also, ferrites. People, you know, add a couple more ferrites than you think. You can always add like four and they're cheap. They're like a penny a piece. Hacking, making, tinkering, engineering, or programming? You got to do them all. There's nothing now that's just hardware or just firmware or just software. Everything these days is a combo of IoT, wireless, battery management, firmware, hardware. So you need to know a little bit of everything. And, you know, you tinker at the beginning, make in the middle, and then manufacture at the end. All right. Well, let's get into a little bit more detail on the questions. And the first one... If you are on a plane and you are sitting next to someone who's not technical, how do you explain what Adafruit does? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm often explaining things to, to, you know, people ask, what is Adafruit? And the best way I can explain it is, you know, you're, remember when you were in school and you were in science lab and you had a box of parts and they were like, okay, build a pendulum or build a light bulb circuit. Um, basically, that's what we make. We make all the parts that you put together to learn, to create, to prototype, and sometimes even manufacture your own custom electronics. So not using just stuff off the shelf, but making something that satisfies your, your community's needs. And you were at MIT and getting a master's degree in electrical engineering, and you suddenly, accidentally started a business in your dorm room? Is this, is this story true or apocryphal? Yeah, no, it was, it's true. I was really didn't want to work on my thesis. And so I was spending time doing pretty much anything other than that, um, which includes, um, you know, building at the time, you know, there were these MP3 decoder chips. So I made a little MP3 decoder in a mint tin called a Minty MP3. And also, you know, at MIT, we have this thing called Rush, which I don't I don't know if they really have it anymore. But the freshmen, you know, you get to choose where you live. So you want to have, you know, right. This is like the week before classes start. And so you want to uh, get 
the coolest kids into your dorm. It was a little bit of a competition. And so you would have events. And one of the events that we did was a solder together your own Persistence of Vision LED kit. So that was actually the first kit I designed, which became the mini POV. Although I think the first version was a, based on a PIC, not an AVR. And it was LEDs and the kids would, you know, they would solder together the kit and then they would program in their name. And so it was kind of an, you know, a, a introduction to hardware and software and firmware um, for our students. And then, you know, those kits that I was making, the, the Mini Pav and the Minty MP3 and then the Zoxbox synthesizer became the kits that we sold at Adafruit. Uh, how did you grow the business? I mean, as an engineer, I always find growing business to be very difficult. It is challenging. And I think part of it is you have to constantly be making new stuff, which is exciting for an engineer, but you also have to make sure that you're maintaining and supporting the old stuff, which is not usually yeah. that fun for engineers. Um, so we have, you know, 4,000 products in the store, but when we started, we only had two or three. And, you know, it was just basically every week I would have to add something new, whether it was a component or, or a cable or an accessory or um, a product. So at first, you know, I had a couple kits and then I added, you know, maybe programming cables and then, um, you know, programming adapters and then other kits. And so I would, you know, slowly and surely um, add more products one by one until now we have 4,000. But it's like over 15 years almost. It's like, it's not five, two weeks. Yeah. It's good to remember that. And that constant addition, the the constant upkeep is always required. Yeah, we do a show every week on Wednesdays where we do show and tell and then we do Ask Engineer and we have the new product section. And every week there has to be something new. I try to have one new, you know, custom manufactured product every week. And then we usually have like three or four from the community or just, you know, components and parts. How much of your day is spent on education, like writing tutorials and outreach sorts of activities versus engineering versus doing business things? It's about, you know, a quarter of each. Um, you know, the, the business stuff always takes priority. You have to take care of the people that you have, make sure that they've got the benefits and the payroll and everything's taken care of um, and, and promote and nurture the people and give them opportunities in your company. If you have 100 people, we don't hire, you know, outside experts and consultants. We train people from within. Um, you know, every week I try to work maybe like eight hours a week on a new product um, and, you know, exploring new stuff like this week I'm exploring TensorFlow Lite, which is, uh, you know, micro uh, machine learning platform that will run on microcontrollers. But I'm also maintaining and updating old uh, tutorials and guides and code. We have, you know, 1,200 GitHub repos, and and some of those have continuous integration. Some of them don't. Um, But we get notices like, hey, this no longer compiles an Arduino or, you know, AVR GCC now throws an error here. Um, And so we take pull requests and triage them and merge them in as necessary. And, uh, and they also try to have, you know, a little fun, like see what's, what's happening in the maker community. Um, like, you know, this weekend is teardown. And so I'm watching kind of some of those videos to see like, what are people doing? Um, and getting inspired by what the community is up to. If you could only serve one community, would you choose the artists, the STEM educators, the makers working at home or the engineers trying new parts? They're actually all kind of the same people. Right. So yeah. what's neat is, you know, I, I hate people like everything, but, <laughs> you know, we, we, t- you know, we initially were only for, you know, makers and, and hackers, you know, you would have to run GCC on your computer and you would have to wire up a serial port and you'd have to solder the kids together. And now we're reaching more people like the accessibility tech community. These are people um, who both need and are making accessibility technology for their friends or family And um, some of them have technical skills. They can do 3D printing and some assembly, but a lot of them are like, well, it has to be kind of plug and play and easy to maintain because the people who might be maintaining them are, you know, a nurse or a care practitioner. They're not somebody who's technical. So then the question is, how do you design and engineer these kind of products and components so that they can be put together by anybody? It's not easy, right? It's easy to just put, you know, a read me up and say, you know, run, make, good luck. Uh, it's a lot harder to make something easy for anybody to use. But if you do that, the engineers like it too, right? So you get more engineers interested because even engineers have a limited time. Oh, I'm so lazy. When you guys have a great <laughs> tutorial or a bunch of code that I can just try, 
and maybe I have to strip out things because I need it to be for one processor or slower, or, or I mean, or I need it to run faster. I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's great. Yeah. Make it really easy. I mean, everyone has suffered through, you know, projects that looked really cool. And then the documentation or code is just, it's just a nightmare. So it's, you know, it's a lot more work to do that. You know, by the way, putting together a, a hardware design is trivial. It takes like three hours in Eagle CAD or Kai CAD or whatever. It's very easy to design hardware. I know people say hardware is hard. Yeah. Okay. It's hard to get it like perfect, perfect, you know, low power, whatever. Hardware is, is easy in my opinion. It's firmware and software and documentation that's hard, especially if you want to do a good job at it. And so that's what a lot of people skip out on. How do you decide when something is done, when it is enough to publish? Um, I kind of have a, um, I have a gut instinct of what I think is, a, you know, a good completed demo, but usually I try to get, you know, 80% coverage. You know, if I release a breakout for a sensor, I might not have absolutely everything that the sensor can do, but as long as I get the the core things that are advertised for it, I think my, my biggest pet peeve is when there's a device and people like say, oh yeah, it can do this thing. And then it's never document, you know, it's like, oh, it has like a Bluetooth module in it. And it's like, cool. Okay. Then you have this dream of like, I can use Bluetooth, but then you actually get to the API and there's like a big to do. And you're like, oh, like I bought this part because I thought that was done and it's not. I think that's what's frustrating. So I think, you know, the, the top level things, if you say it has Wi-Fi, you know, you should actually implement Wi-Fi. Yes. Yes, there are so many vendors that I just want to take that to yeah, and say, you know exactly what I'm yes. talking about. Like everyone's like, that makes no sense. But anyone who's actually done this engineering is like, I have absolutely experienced this. And it's it's so frustrating because now you're just waiting and waiting. Like, are they ever going to do it? Who knows? Maybe. So I think on release, you should have any, any top level things should be working. Do you have any favorite uh, Adafruit projects or products? My current favorite stuff is um, whatever I'm working on latest, right? It's always yeah. um, so we just released the Pi Gamer and Pi Badge, and so these are little you know portable gaming or like display interface and you know UI interface devices. One is kind of it's actually kind of the same hardware. One is made for playing games, and you can use it with um, Make Code Arcade, which is a really neat open source drag and drop uh, video game building engine but also with Python and Arduino and then the Pi badge, which is more of uh, like it's a credit card sized, you know, a conference badge. So it's like a smart badge. And um, that's, you know, you can still run MakeCode Arcade and Arduino and Circuit Python on it, but it's kind of designed specifically for people who are attending events and conferences and they want to have an interactive uh, electronic badge that is really easy to program. Do you foresee conference vendors buying a bunch and programming them all to be related to the conference or? Yes, I can't talk about it, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's probably, it's likely. Um, but you'll, I think people will be excited. For now, it's just for people, individuals, but I think they'll, people will be happy to see some events coming up that will be giving these away to people or sponsoring badge gives, giveaways. It would be nice to have some standardization between conferences because then you could reuse badges. It would be fun. I think I personally, my whole goal here is it's just really easy to program like with CircuitPython um, or make code arcade. It's very plug and play. I think I've seen a lot of really cool badges, but again, it's like, wow, this badge can do so much and I will have to spend 12 hours to get it to do these things. Um, trying to make it so people can actually sit down and win half an hour you know, modify the badge to display their their face, that QR code with their information and their name, um, multi-language support. So it's one of the cool things about Python 3 is it has Unicode. So our badge demo works with Hebrew, Greek, Japanese, like any language you want, not just English. So trying to think like, what do people actually want to do around the world with these badges? How much is Adafruit International? Um, like wh what percentage of sales do we sell to the international customers? Sure. If you want to share that or just how many countries do you ship to? We ship to just about every country we are legally allowed to ship to. Um, we ship to, I think, you know, easily 50 countries and I think maybe like 30% of our sales are international. Note that includes Canada. Um, we love Canada, but it, it is another country. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we, we sell a lot to Canada but also to Australia, to Germany, um, England, uh, Japan. 
One of the things uh, you mentioned was that hobbyists buy the modules and, and parts and sensors and things, and that it, you've made it really easy for people to prototype things and put together, uh, you know, an entire device with example code and, and um, nice, friendly hardware. But you also mentioned that people build products on it. And I wonder how much, how much are you trying to help bridge that gap between, okay, module and you can build a product on this? Everything that we release is, is pure open source hardware. And I don't mean like pretend open source hardware. It really is all licensed under MIT or BSD or in some cases GPL um, licenses. So you can absolutely take our schematic and hardware layout and you paste it into your product and you're done. Um, you just give the credit on wherever it makes sense, whether a physical leaflet or some readme file somewhere um, or on the schematic but it is open source and we have absolutely seen, I've seen multiple products um, within the maker community and the tech community that definitely uses our hardware. Like I can see it and I'm like, oh yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's the parts. Like I just know that layout um, and that's fine. That's, that's exactly what we designed it for. Um, you know, a lot of the designs we have, they're just, they're, there's nothing of value in them. Again, the hardware is really easy to design. It's the, the firmware and software and the tutorials that make it valuable. Um, just copying a data sheet onto a PCB does, does, it does not constitute intellectual property of significant value, in my opinion. Mm. Um, so we do have, you know, I know companies for sure that have either include our modules as is, or they've copied and pasted them into the design and do the manufacturing themselves. Um, both are uh, totally legit and uh, occur commonly. That makes sense for when they're building larger things and they're incorporating uh, your designs into their larger things. What about the ones where it's basically the same board you make and it's taken from all of your open information and sold for less? Does that... That, ha that yeah. happens too. Um, oh, yeah. You know, we, we definitely have, you know, there's there's people who will take our boards and run them. Uh, in fact, you know, it's one of the funny things is sometimes I look on um, to see what people are making on um, Osh Park, and I see people, they just upload our designs and make them, and that's fine. Maybe they want them in purple. I can understand that. And and that's cool. Again, it's it's open source. They can absolutely do that. Um, a lot of our boards are attributions. They just have to give credit, but they can't use our logo and name. They can't right. imply that it's made by Adafruit because we don't do the tech support for those items. And we just tell people, hey, if you don't, if you didn't buy the sensor from us, we don't do tech support. You can use our code, but we just don't have, we, we don't have the ability to provide support to like the millions of people who might be making, you know, clones and, you know, uh, they need, you know, handholding support. For that, you have to go to the vendor. And I think that's fair. I think it is too. Although because you have your, because you are so open, most of the time, I wouldn't need to go to the vendor. I can just buy it on Amazon from someone else and then use your tutorial. And and then at the end of the day, I start thinking about, well, gosh, what I really want is for them to keep writing tutorials. It's worth the extra couple bucks to make I sure. Think, I think we tell people that and they, they know it. Like I understand some people, they just want to get it immediately or they want it. They have to get it at a certain budget. And I understand that. I'd, I'd ask, hey, you know, when you do have the ability to support Adafruit, um, do so. You can do that by purchasing. You can do that by contributing bug fixes. You can do that by contributing projects. It doesn't have to be just financial. There's a lot of stuff that you can do in the community. You can hang out on Discord and, and chit chat with people. There's ways to contribute even if you're broke. Um, you know, if you can buy stuff from us, that's always welcome. Uh, and, you know, we think we'll give you a good value hardware in return. What is the com competition versus cooperation landscape between you and SparkFun and DigiKey? I think that we're all kind of like skateboarders <laughs> at a skate park and we're all kind of like, check out this trick I did. And then everyone's like, that's a cool trick, but like I can do that plus a 360. Right. So it's a little bit of this really good, healthy um, one upmanship that I think makes the community, the maker and, and engineer community so much more vibrant. Right. Because if it was, I think if we did have this like open, if we didn't have open source electronics, if it was everybody's closed and it's proprietary and you had to sign NDAs, I think there wouldn't be a lot of incentive for people to try to do better. But because it's all open, it's really easy to see how you can improve. And so people can take our designs, improve them. We'll look at them and be like, that's pretty cool. And then we'll maybe integrate some of those 
you know, improvements into our designs. And so there is um, this kind of healthy ecosystem of hardware and firmware and software all being shared. Um, you know, for example, we all uh, use the Arduino ID for stuff, but we've, you know, each company has contributed to what you can do with Arduino. And some of that has actually been um, merged upstream as well. So this is, I think it's kind of a good and, and healthy ecosystem, I think, but yeah, I like doing tricks. It's how it's supposed to work. That's how, I mean, we talked to Alicia Gibb recently and she said, you're supposed to give back and then your stuff gets better and then it's all a great ecosystem. It's exactly, I don't always believe it works. (laughs) It does work. I think, I think the community that we have can do that. I mean, I think there's once in a while, there's people who come by and maybe they don't understand the rules of the community, some of which are spoken, some which are unspoken, you know, such as, you know, give credit when you do something and, and don't strip people's names off of um, their projects and then submit them as your own. But I think when that does happen, people in the community will tell that person, hey, you know, you're new, you don't, maybe you don't know this, but you, this kind of behavior is frowned upon. And the peer pressure is more powerful than anything. They'll, they'll usually quickly say, oh, shoot, didn't realize that. And they'll update um, their documentation or their tutorial and say, hey, you know, this is based off of another person's project. And that's, I think that's good. I think it makes everybody feel good about what they're doing and what they're con- contributing. Do you have any uh, favorite projects or products that people haven't really noticed that, that you worked on and you were like, everybody's going to love this. It's going to be the gr- next greatest NeoPixels. And then <laughs> nobody quite noticed yet. I don't think so. I think I think most of the stuff that we've done has been picked up. The most recent technology that I think is very exciting um, is that one of our engineers, Hatak, uh, who's just just brilliant firmware engineer and USB stack magician, um, has this USB stack called Teeny USB, and it's a totally open source USB stack. Um, from the lowest HAL all the way up to um, implementing, you know, mass storage, USB host, MIDI, um, USB serial CDC. And what's neat is that if if you've ever done USB stack development on a microcontroller, and most microcontrollers come with USB peripherals now, they require you to use their stack, which is under like a not truly open source license. They say, you know, the, the source code is available, you can use it, but you cannot use this code on any microcontroller from a competing chip vendor. So there's like the microchip stack, there's the TI stack, there's the ST stack, there's the da-da-da. Everybody's got their own. And it's really frustrating because you can't have any portable, you can't have any portable designs because if you write your code and it runs on an ARM Cortex from one vendor, you, you're not permitted to run on another vendor. This teeny USB stack, what we did is made it so, you know, it runs, I think, uh, right now it runs SAMD chips from Atmel, mm-hmm. a microchip. It runs um, ST, STM32 F4 series chips, a bunch of LPC series chips, and Nordic NRF52840 uh, chips, which have USB. And we're, you know, I know there's also a fork for um, ICE40 FPGAs as well that hopefully will get merged um, upstream once they're done with it. And, um, I really want to get more people using it because we we did a really nice, truly open source stack. And if everyone who has their own chip just contributes their HAL layer, their hardware abstraction layer to it, we can have a stack that's usable by anybody for everything. We use the stack in CircuitPython. Um, We also now have it in the Arduino IDE, so you can use it. And it opens up the possibilities of having a really good USB experience because you're not like dealing with every mystery stack. You've got everything all laid out and ready to go. So I think that's kind of the thing. I think people have noticed it, but I think maybe people don't realize how cool and revolutionary this can be. Can you please do this for Bluetooth? (laughs) Bluetooth is, you know, we're looking at Bluetooth and Bluetooth is really hard because on the desktop, it's really inconsistent. On mobile, it's really inconsistent. We're doing an API for CircuitPython for Bluetooth, and this, the, the toughest problem is just what's the API division? Where where do we go to the C layer? Where do we go to the Python layer? And it's easy if you're just doing, okay, I make a GAT, and I connect, and I send data back and forth. That's easy. But then, you know, there's Mesh, and, you know, you want to do advertising, you want to do Central, maybe you do Central and Peripheral at the same time. It gets 
very weird, very fast. Like Bluetooth, I think they kind of went a little too bonkers. Ironically, Wi-Fi is trivial, right? We figured out a sockets layer for Wi-Fi and, and we're done. Um, everything works over sockets. But, you know, luckily that was designed back when computers were very, very underpowered compared to what we have now. And so they couldn't go bonkers. They had to come up with something simple. Uh, now, unfortunately, we have um, too much too much ability to handle complexity. So they made it complex. We have some listener questions. Uh, okay. And I want to go through some of those. Uh, although every person we talked to said thank you. Okay. Could you Could you thank her for making Welcome. Seth more popular? Could you thank everybody on the team? Could you, and and they listed uh, Becky and Becky and so many other people. So many other people. Phil <laughs> and Bree and Colin and you and it was just everybody said thank you. I don't know if you get that enough, but you've made a lot of people's lives quite a bit easier. Yeah, and thanks to everybody who has been part of the community. Is you know there's there's people like Becky who've done videos, um, people like Bree who are you know part of the community. He never worked for Adafruit, but he was you know working alongside Adafruit at MakerBot, and I think got a lot of inspiration for the open source hardware stuff that he did do um, from Adafruit. And I think all we can do is every day just stick to um, we stick to our ethics and morals and ideas of what we think hardware and software and firmware and engineering should be. And, you know, we hope that we bring along people with us as we do so. So one of the questions we got multiple times was about Radio Shack. You were, you had a picture of you with a Radio Shack certificate or something. And so people thought you bought Radio Shack and were... Yeah, it's true. If you have a photo of a certificate, that means you own it. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that... True. It's Thanks. true. I gotta it's go true. write something. <laughs> it's on, if it's on the internet and there's a photo, it, just, it means you want it. Sorry, sorry, folks. What is the deal there? Is there a deal there? We knew uh, someone who was a um, part of the finance department at Radio Shack, and and as they were clearing out their inventory from a warehouse, he uh, smuggled us this cool, uh, certi- you know, frame certificate from some old. They just found it in the warehouse and they're like, this is really cool. So he, he sent it to us and so we could have it because everything had to go into uh, you know, being sold to pay off their debts. But we snagged this. It's pretty cool. It's like these old 1980s, like 100 stock certificate entry, you know, whatever it is for some guy. And uh, yeah, they're framed. They look really cool. I don't think they give certificates out anymore when you buy stock. It's all completely internet based. This is from back in the pre-cyber days. Wow, did that story get garbled then? <laughs> I don't know. I, I said nothing. I, you guys all came up with this stuff. I, you just took a photo. Exactly. And uh, I mean, Bailey is anxiously awaiting brick and mortar stores. Matt would like stores and maker spaces all put in where the old Radio Shacks were. Everybody's the, ready for you to buy Radio Shack. <laughs> it's yeah, pretty well, weird. I, I think that I don't ship think is sale. It's, <laughs> it's kind of not for sale anymore. I think that um, for brick and mortar stores, I think... You know, we have um, Adafruit stuff available at Micro Center. And there's like one or two Radio Shacks left over that are like privately owned and they do stock Adafruit stuff. But it's just tough when you have 4,000 products. Yeah. And, yeah, you what know, do you choose? How do you, how do you show the data sheets and schematics when you're in a store? It's tough. And, you know, we ship, you know, same day if you order before, I think, noon uh, Eastern time. We also have same day shipping in, in the Manhattan area. So I think... Yes, you, you may not be able to go physically into the Adafruit shop, but you can get it the next day. You know, also our, our distributors, DigiKey, you can order up to 8 p.m. and get it the next day, which is like kind of magical. Um, so that's how we get around the um, complexities of like, you know, how would we have a store? Well, how about we just make it so you can get it the next day? I think that's totally fair and much easier. Easier for stocking, for sure. Yeah. Uh, ben Hanky, I noticed that earlier in Adafruit's life, there were awesome business meta infos, things about running a business, sourcing, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Did you stop because they were trade secrets or just busy with more engineering focused things? Um, we actually kind of put up every, the, everything that are in those articles are the same things we're doing now. Like I literally have the exact same, I have like an article about how to turn a scale and a USB barcode reader into a shipping station, we're running that exact same code like 10 years later. So there's actually nothing that I've 
I would add. Um, everything that's in there is the basis of the company. Now, you know, the only other article maybe I would write is, okay, now make more products. But the, the bones of Adafruit as we published it are exactly the same. There's actually nothing to add. Um, and also we do publish a newsletter uh, kind of like maker manufacturing and we uh, publish every Monday an article and we, we highlight other companies and information they published, like Sele, you mentioned they were on an earlier show. They have really good articles talking about um, their travels through manufacturing, insourcing, outsourcing. And uh, Bunny Wang just did a really great article this weekend about open source and tariffs. So I think, you know, we have some articles that we've published a while ago, and I think there's other people who are running businesses, um, whether they be from, you know, Tindy or Osh Park or Crowd Supply, that are learning their own path and contributing their own documentation. So I'd say don't just look at our stuff, look at what everybody else is doing is too. Cool. Alexander wanted to know if you have some lesser known but interesting projects that have come from the convergence of open source and open hardware. Boy, that's very open-ended. Yeah. I mean, that's like ESP uh, 32s and NeoPixels and, and light shows. And I, God, there's so many things you can answer, but I should let you answer. Sorry. Yeah. I was trying to like, that's really fun. I think the, the, I think the most interesting convergence that I've seen lately for open source hardware and software has been what AT makers and the assistive tech community has been doing, which is really fascinating. So assistive tech is, Again, this technology that some people need, whether it is to, you know, move around the house or pick up or command their lights. Uh, a lot of it is how to take something that maybe has very small buttons and convert to large, easy to press buttons or adding um, voice commands or um, interfacing with accessibility technology like a soundboard. And what's neat is it's a perfect opportunity for open source hardware and software because everybody's assistive tech needs are different. Like everybody has their own abilities and things that they need to help with. So even though there's a lot of off the shelf assistive tech, you still need to kind of glue it together to make like a custom rig for whatever that person needs, whether it's like, okay, they have a wheelchair, but they have to make the joystick easier to move. Um, or they want voice commands, but you know, the voice commands have to be able to handle their enunciation. So I think seeing how they're taking all this open source hardware and software and gluing together these pieces to make custom devices. It's, it's not just like, okay, I'm, I'm making this cool drone over the weekend. It's, you know, my mother needs a way to be able to um, page through her audiobooks without having to press the little button on her Kindle. How do I do that? One of the hardest things for that technology is that it is used by the people who are different than those who create it. And when it fails, it is often more frustrating than if you had never had it. For example, uh, something to help press buttons for books to, as you just said. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of worse when mom is used to doing that and then it stops working because internet fail. Yeah. And this is, this is the challenge that there is with assistive tech. I remember reading, you know, many years ago, um, about Stephen Hawking's voice system that he used to, um, to speak with people. And it was designed by someone. And I guess, either, you know, that person or that company went out of business. They didn't have the files anymore. So he had this one box that did his voice control and there was no documentation. There was no source code. So basically people keep, kept having to like all this team of people had to patch putting it together, they couldn't remake it. It had to run on the original hardware because nobody had access to the, the source files. And so that's where I think open source hardware and software does do really well. If you're going to make technology for somebody and it needs to run for 20, 30, 40 years, having it be closed and proprietary, it, it, that's more hmm. scary to me than having something where, okay, the source code is open and anyone can read it because these companies go out of business or, you know, the person who wrote the code also is in, unable to maintain it. Um, and then that person who's using the assistive technology is really stuck. So having having the documentation and the, and the design be available so other people can repair it and update it and upgrade it, I think it's very powerful. Yes. Yes. We need more of that. Do you have any advice for people from software getting into hardware? Why did, 
why did Alex ask her? She's a hardware engineer getting into software. Anyway, do you have any advice? Sorry. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> do you have any? Do I have any advice for software people getting into hardware? Yeah, books or tools or projects. I think it's you know a lot easier these days because um, most hardware is software based. Um, you know, one of the things you can do if you know software is you can get dev boards where it has all the hardware pieces you want. You know, find some dev board that already has the displays, the buttons and switches that you want. And then it's all firmware. It's just about getting that firmware running. So you do you do need to know C or CircuitPython these days. It's one thing that is different. A lot of people who are developers now know, you know, JavaScript or they know, um, you know, maybe they know Rust or Golang. And while those languages are being ported to microcontrollers, the 95% of it is still in C or C++. And maybe, you know, 4% of it is in Python and then 1% is, you know, assembler or something else. So I think the the most important skill is to just brush up on your C and C++. You'll need it. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of good papers on, you know, embedded development um, with C and C++, just, you know, things to watch out for, like you don't have infinite memory and, you know, interrupts are kind of interesting and weird. Um, but I think just start with, start with the existing hardware and get your firmware software running on it. And then you can just look, take a look at the schematic and then cut away the pieces you don't need or add the pieces you do need. That totally makes sense. And I 100% agree. Find a board, play with it. Mm. That is, that is the way to go. I know that you wanted to uh, get out of here a bit early, so I have one more question. Okay. Although Christopher may have another after that, so I'll just... But I think like, we, we got to everything, right? No, there was so much more I could have added. <laughs> I wanted to dig into like how you do the engineering and all of your people. But I think one of the other things I wanted to ask you about was a little bit more personal. You, you've, you've made a huge impact through Adafruit. I mean, the whole making community says thank you. But do you ever wonder what your life would have been like if at some point it was just a different path and you'd said, no, this whole uh, kit thing is cool, but it'd be a lot easier if I just go work for a company and get a steady paycheck and continual health care and all of the easy, I mean, you get a master's in EE, you get a job. Do you wonder? Um, not really, because I, I just know I wouldn't, I, I just wouldn't be able to survive. Like I can't have, I can't have someone tell me what to do and not to do. I just, this is, I have to be able to control my own destiny and create these things that need to be created. It's like asking an artist, Hey, don't you want to work for an advertising firm? And it's like, <laughs> well, I mean, like, I guess you could, but then you wouldn't be able to make the art that was in your brain. And you have to get that art out. You have to get that hardware and design and there's projects out and it's just so fulfilling. And we have really good healthcare, by the way. Um, <laughs> everyone, <laughs> everyone gets the same 401k and same healthcare. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, and we are looking for PHP developers, by the way. So if anybody is listening and uh, they want to you know, move to New York possibly and uh, work at a very chill company where we pay well, you get great benefits and everyone's out of the door at six o'clock. They come in at 10, they leave at 6, and nobody stays late. Nobody works more than 40 hours at Adafruit except maybe like me and Phil. Um, it's a very uh, healthy company, but we get a lot done. I think our listeners right now are wanting to know how big is the employee discount? <laughs> it's free. You get you get anything you want. People are always shocked that like, I hire like engineers, and they're like, what do you mean they get stuff for free? And I'm like, you know, I'm paying you like. Six yeah. digits. Yes. Like, if you get like two hundred dollars worth of electronics, here's, here's really, a hundred bucks, kid. Go nuts. I know this is really not a deal. But you get uh, you get all the free electronics you can you can carry. Well, uh, excuse and me, it, I have to go learn PHP. <laughs> <laughs> Although I would never move to New York. I bet it's awesome. But well, apply even you know you never know. Send 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 us a note even if you uh, are not interested in relocating, and we'll we'll take a look. But um, you know we have about a hundred people. At Adafruit and uh, very low churn. Everyone's super happy at the company, and you know we do everything there. It's it's neat. We have uh, shipping, we have warehousing, we have manufacturing, we have development, we have you know our finance and customer support teams, um, pretty much all in house. We have a couple of remote folks as well. Uh, Circuit Python team is almost all remote, for example. Um, but yeah, it's just everyone's working together towards making cool stuff. 
And there are some people who just have this image of you and Phil and maybe one or two other people soldering things by hand. A new thing every day. <laughs> not, not like that anymore. We have about 100 people, um, 120 total maybe with all the, the remote folks. Um, so, you know, Phil and I, we still do a bunch of soldering and we do videos. You know, we do a video tonight um, and we do uh, projects and stuff. But we have some amazing, amazing people who help with the everyday from shipping your order correctly and on time to uh, running the pick and place machine. Cool. Well, Amor, do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Um, yeah, thank you for having me. The, I think it's so neat that we have, you know, podcasts and videos and conferences and events. Uh, you know, this maker community is something very, very special. Um, the engineer maker community and, I love that we work together well. You know, I think it, it it could have easily turned into like, you're a maker, you're an engineer, you're a prototype, you're a student, you know, you're not part of this team and, you know, you suck and you don't know how to code. But instead, everyone is working together and helping each other. And we're all doing these skateboard tricks and showing off. And I think it's just like, it's so cool and magical and wonderful. And it's not how the world often works. So I think we should really cherish what we have. And uh, if, as you are cherishing what you have, you have a cool project, come by on our show. We have Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern time, our show and tell. Come by with whatever hardware, crafting, or electronics, or mechanical engineering stuff you built and show it off on our Google Hangout. We'd love to see it. And uh, you get a free sticker. Cool. Cool. The, the information for that will be in our show notes, although Thank you. seriously, you can Google it. I'm sure you can, listeners. We also have a 24-hour uh, Discord server. So if people are like, oh, I can't make it Wednesday, 730, uh, check out our Discord server, adafruit.it slash Discord, or just Google for Adafruit Discord and probably click the first link uh, and join in. And we have a, you know 12,000 people uh, showing and sharing, teaching, debugging, helping, <laughs> sharing cool gifts. Uh, it's a really good, healthy community of people um, having fun with making electronics and engineering. Our guest has been Lemore Freed, founder and lead engineer of Adafruit Industries. Thanks, Lemore. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to everyone at Adafruit because you have made it better. And listeners, you may have noticed a lack of questions about Circuit Python. We're going to have a whole show about that in a few weeks. So I didn't. I know. I, I wanted to like keep it light. They, they'll they focus on it like crazy. We'll, we'll go deep on that one. Ooh, snakes. And thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. You can always contact us at show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on embedded.fm. And now a question to. <laughs> a question. And now a quote to leave you with. This is from Ada L Ada King, Countess of Lovelace, as she uh, is more properly known if you're going to care about the titles. <laughs> I am never really satisfied that I understand anything because understand it as well as I may. My comprehension can only be an infinitesimal fraction of all I want to understand. Embedded is an independently produced radio show that focuses on the many aspects of engineering. It is a production of Logical Elegance, an embedded software consulting company in California. If there are advertisements in the show, we did not put them there and do not receive money from them. At this time, our sponsors are Logical Elegance and listeners like you.